Yesterday afternoon, everyone assembled in this historic tabernacle was given the opportunity to raise his right hand to the square and sustain in the positions to which they had been called the leadership of the church. The upraised hand is really an outward expression of an inner feeling. When one raises his hand, he pledges his heart. Frequently, the Lord Jesus Christ spoke of hand and heart in a revelation given through the prophet Joseph Smith at Hiram, Ohio, in March of 1832. The Lord counseled, be faithful, stand in the office in which I have appointed you. Succor the weak, lift up the hands that hang down, and strengthen the feeble knees. And if ye are faithful unto the end, ye shall inherit a crown of immortality and eternal life in the mansions which I have prepared in the house of my Father. When I listen to those words, when I read them, I can almost hear the shuffle of the sandaled feet and the murmurs of astonishment which came from the multitude at Capernaum's peaceful scene. Here, many people brought their sick to the master that he might heal them. A palsied man picked up his bed and walked, and a Roman centurion's faith restored his servant's health. Not only by precept did Jesus teach, but also by example. He stood in the office appointed unto him. He stretched forth his hand that he might lift others unto God. It was at Galilee that a leper approached the Lord, and he said unto him, Lord, if thou wilt, thou canst heal me. And Jesus stretched forth his hand touching him and said, I will, be thou clean, and immediately the leprosy was cleansed. Now the hand of Jesus was not polluted by touching the body of the leper, but the leper's body was cleansed through one touch of that holy hand. On another occasion at Capernaum, at the home of Peter, the mother of Peter's wife was afflicted by a high fever. The sacred record reveals that Jesus took her by the hand and lifted her up, and immediately the fever left her. All of us are familiar with yet another example. Jairus, ruler of the synagogue, came to the Savior with the plea, My little daughter lieth at the point of death. I pray thee, come and lay thy hands upon her, that she may be healed, and she shall live. And while he was yet importuning the Savior, a messenger came with the tragic news, Thy daughter is dead, trouble not the master. But Jesus said unto him, Fear not, believe only, and she shall be made whole. The parents wept, others mourned. But again Jesus said, Weep not, she is not dead, but sleepeth. And he went to her and took her by the hand, and said, Maid, arise. And her spirit came to her straightway once again, and she arose. In all three instances, the Savior had extended his hand that he might lift another to a newness of life. The apostles observed his example. They realized that Jesus lived not to be ministered to, but to minister, not to receive, but to give not to save his life, but to literally pour it out in service of his heavenly Father. You remember that it was Peter and John who went to the gate beautiful of the temple, and there they were confronted by a lame beggar who each morning had been placed there and would be placed there by his loved ones that he might ask alms of those who entered the temple. That he regarded Peter and John as any other passerby, 
is evidenced by the fact that he stretched forth his hand and asked an offering from them. He received not an offering, but rather a gentle command. Said Peter, look upon us. And then there issued from the lips of Peter those words which have thrilled all Christendom down through the stream of time even to today, silver and gold have I none. That which I have, give I thee. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. And then the next verse records that Jesus took him by the hand and lifted him up. And he stood, he walked, and he followed them into the temple. A willing hand had been extended. A maimed and crippled body had been healed. A precious soul had been lifted to God. Now time passes and circumstances change, conditions vary, but unaltered is the divine command to succor the weak, to lift up the hands that hang down and strengthen the feeble knees. You and I, we have the responsibility not to be doubters, but to be doers. Not to be leaners, but to be lifters. But unfortunately, our complacency tree has many branches, and each spring many new buds come into bloom. We live frequently side by side, but fail to communicate heart to heart. There are those within our own sphere of influence who from the anguish and the depths of their souls cry out, is there no balm in Gilead? And we must answer. What will our answer be? Edwin Markham said, there is a destiny that makes us brothers. None lives to self alone. All that we send into the lives of others comes back into our own. One who lived for self alone was a character made famous by Dickens in his classic, A Christmas Carol. Do you remember Ebenezer Scrooge, that skinflint, that miser, that man who was the most hated man in all of his community? I remember him. He awakened one night in a dream, and before him stood his departed partner, Jacob Marley, second to Scrooge on the most unloved list of his hometown. <laughs> Jacob Marley was fettered with a chain, and Scrooge said unto him, Why, Jacob, you are fettered by a chain. And the dialogue which came then from Marley to Scrooge has application to you and to me today. Jacob Marley lamented, I wear the chain I forged in life not to know that any Christian spirit working in its tiny sphere will find its mortal life far too short for its vast means of usefulness, not to know that no space of regret can make amends for one life's opportunities misused. Yet such was I, oh, such was I. Why did I wander through throngs of beings with my eyes cast down and not once lift them to that star which guided wise men to a poor abode? Were there no poor homes toward which its light might have conducted me? And then Scrooge, in an effort to comfort Marley, said, But Jacob, you were always such a fine man in business. Business, said Marley. Mankind was my business. Now, we all know the miracle that took place in the life of Scrooge. Overnight, he became the most generous, the most lovable, the person who most loved his neighbor as himself. In fact, he himself said, I am not the man I once was. A miracle had taken place in the life of Scrooge. Miracles can take place every day when we lift others toward God. It was the Apostle John 
who wrote 1900 years ago, he that loveth not his brother abideth in death. Yet there are those today who look at the unfortunate, who look at the sinner, and then they say, he's brought it upon himself. Oh, he'll never change. I knew he would come to no good end. You've heard those comments. I've heard them. But there are a few who look beyond the outward circumstance and see the real worth of a human soul. And when they do, great changes occur. The downtrodden, the dejected, those who are without hope, become no more strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and of the household of God. Love is the binding band. Love can change human nature. It can alter human lives. I suppose this was beautifully described, at least to me, in George Bernard Shaw's Pygmalion, later set to music in the popular musical My Fair Lady. Do you remember Eliza Doolittle, the flower girl? She was speaking to one for whom she had great respect and who was later to lift her to a newness of life. Eliza said, you see, apart from the simple things such as how one dresses or how one speaks, the difference between a flower girl and a lady is not so much how she behaves as how she is treated. I shall always be a flower girl to Professor Higgins, for he always treats me as a flower girl and always will. But I can be a lady to you because you always treat me as a lady and always will. Eliza Doolittle was expressing the profound truth. When we treat an individual merely as he is, he will remain as he is. When we treat an individual as though he were what he should be, he will become what he should be. Jesus Christ of Nazareth was the greater exemplar of this truth. He changed men. He changed their ambitions. He changed their objectives. He changed their attitudes. He changed their nature. He changed their habits. He changed their hearts. He lifted. He loved. He brought men close to God. We have the opportunity and the responsibility to follow his divine example. I think of an account related a long while ago by prison warden Kenyon Scudder. A friend of his was riding on a railway coach across country with a fellow passenger, a silent fellow, never said a word. But after a little time, the two engaged in conversation. The passenger said that he was an ex-convict, free on parole after long years in federal penitentiary. He was returning to his home. He revealed to his companion that his actions had brought disgrace and heartache to his mother and to his father, to his community, that the years in prison had been long, that his parents had neither visited him frequently nor had written often. He hoped it was because they were too poor to travel and rather uneducated with respect to writing. But then he revealed that he had written a letter to his mother. And in the letter, he said, Dear mother and father, next Tuesday I'll be free on parole. I'll be taking the train which comes by our home. If you feel, mother and dad, that you have it within your heart to forgive me, if you feel that the townspeople could forgive me, if you feel that I could rebuild my life in our own community, would you give me a sign? Would you tie a white ribbon to the old apple tree which stands barren this time of the year next to the railroad track in the lower pasture? And I'll come home. But if you feel it would be best for me and for you, if memories are not sufficiently dim, 
that I should continue on westward and rebuild my life in a, under a different set of circumstances, place no ribbon in the tree. And then he said to his companion, in about five minutes' time, the engineer is going to sound the whistle of this train, indicating the approach of the bend which leads into the valley where our farm is located. And that old apple tree is going to come into view. I don't think I can stand looking. Would you trade places with me and watch for the tree? The two traded places. A few seconds passed, and then there came the sound of the whistle, and soon the acceleration of the train as it moved into the valley where the boy called home. And then there came from the lips of that young man, that repentant sinner, words which were punctuated by sobs. He held his face within his hands, and yet he cried out, Can you see the tree? Can you see the tree? Is there a ribbon on it? And the other man said, I see the tree. I see not one white ribbon. I see dozens of white ribbons. Why, there's a white ribbon on every branch of that old tree. Son, someone surely must love you. In an instant, all of the remorse and all of the rancor and all of the heartache and all of the bitterness left the young man. The companion said it was though, as though he was witnessing a miracle. Miracle indeed. A miracle best described in the words of that favorite hymn, Little Town of Bethlehem. How silently, how silently the precious gift is given. So God imparts to human hearts the blessings of his heaven. No ear may hear his coming, but in this world of sin, where meek souls will receive him yet, the dear Christ enters in. You and I, my brothers and sisters, have the opportunity to participate in such miracles when we, as did the Savior, with hand and with heart, lift our neighbor to a newness of life. When we remember to succor the weak, to lift up the hands that hang down, to strengthen the feeble knees, then we shall qualify for the promise, even a crown of immortality and eternal life in the mansions which the Lord has prepared in the house of his Father. I pray that we might merit such a blessing in the name of Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. <clears throat>